Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so we're so excited to see so many of you on today and uh, for this very important topic. And we're changing things up a little bit today. Normally, Josie is your main moderator, uh, but I have that distinct pleasure today because Josie is actually going to be a panelist today, along with the rest of our panelists. And so, um, so thank you for for being here. We're putting up a. Uh, hopefully, you guys will see here in a minute. We're going to be putting up a PowerPoint for you all. Uh, that uh, our esteemed panelists, so we can introduce everyone. But because I know everyone, I will just introduce them with that. Ah, there we go. Look at that. Um, so as you know, today our topic is all around racism as a public health crisis, uh, and particularly to Riverside County's response because we have an esteemed Riverside County leader here with us today, and. Um, so if I could go to the next slide. And just to do some virtual housekeeping before I get into everything else, please feel free to put um, all of your introductions into the chat box. We love knowing everyone who's on. And if you feel comfortable putting your email address in there and things too, so others can contact you, please do. If you're with an organization, you can list that. If you're a community member, we certainly, we love having our community members on as well. Um, pretty much you're all muted, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, if you do have a question, make sure you put it in the chat box. Um, Sorry about the turn on the video. We're in a format where you're not able to turn on your video, I don't think. Um, and so please feel free to take breaks whenever you need to. And we'll be posting important files and links into the chat box later. And um, so if I could have the next slide. So, so I am so excited about today. We have been looking forward to today. We've been talking with Kim about coming on and making this possible uh, for weeks and, and with our other panelists. So this is really an exciting day. So first of all, we have Kim Saruatari, who is the Director of Public Health for Riverside County for Riverside University Health System dash public health. Um, and we also have Luz Gallegos, the Executive Director from Todek Legal Center. Welcome. Corey Jackson, Executive Director for Sigma Beta Psi. And Miss Josie Gaitan, who has like 80 titles at Reach Out, but her actual title, she's actually over community and governmental relations, but she's also wow. our Latino Health Collaborative Director as well at Reach Out. And she's also over our Center for Civic Policy and Leadership that we're going to talk about at the very end today. So welcome everyone. Um, and I would like to give each of you just a minute to introduce yourselves a little bit more. Kim, if there's anything else you would like to say before we get started. Thank you, Diana. Just thank you so much for bringing this really important topic out uh, to the forefront and always being a champion for uh, racial justice. It's it's something that is uh, near and dear to our heart at the public health department. And but it's also something that we know very much that we can't do al alone. And so it's it's great to be here with you and Luz and Corey and Josie because it truly is a community approach when we're talking about something like this. So thank you again for the invitation to be here with all of you. You bet. You bet. Oh, Kim, we're just so excited this has come together. Uh, Luz, would you like to share anything with us? Well, first of all, I, I really want to thank uh, Reach Out and especially Diana and uh, Josie that are great partners and um, great partners and great people. Uh, and of course, our compañero Corey and Kimberly, I, I thank you so much for the opportunity to elevate the to elevate the stories and uh, of the grassroots as we're talking about this very important topic. So we we'll look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go to Corey. Thank you so much, Luz. Uh, well, greetings, everyone. It's, it's truly a pleasure to to be here. Uh, from the perspective, from my perspective, I'll, you know, I, I wear a few different hats as well, um, and so you know. Um, as we go into whether it's from an SBX Youth and Family Services perspective or 
my role with the NAACP um, and, and other positions is really an opportunity to really share what is possible uh, when opportunities arise and people are willing to step up and, and answer the call. Uh, so looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Corey. Yes, you have several hats that we rely on you for, so thank you for that. And Ms. Gaitan, not that everyone doesn't already know you from all the weeks you've been doing this, but please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Diana. My name is Josie Gaitan, as Diana said. I'm Community and Government Relations of LHC Director at Reach Out. Um, I want to say thank you for everybody for coming and attending. Um, and I am just so excited about what's happening and everything that I've been learning that I didn't know um, there was so much to learn. But I am excited of what we're doing and what's happening in uh, Riverside County. I, and I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been working so hard to um, get this going and um, going forward with it. And talking about the CCPL, uh, what we're going to announce in the, at the end of the thing of the webinar, it's um, very exciting what we're happy, what's happening. Thank you. Uh, Josie, she's setting you up for don't wait right at the end. You're going to have to stay the whole time to learn something exciting. Okay, um, so we are going to go through a lot of content here in a very short amount of time. I'm going to warn people we may go a little over today. Uh, you know, of course, if you need to jump off, but this is such an important message that if you can stay on, we welcome you to do that, but we'll understand if you need to jump off, you know, for another meeting. But just want to let everyone know that's a distinct possibility today. Um, so if I could have the next slide, Jesus. So before we, oh shoot, that one you can barely see at the bottom, but you can still see it. So before we dig into the action that the Board of Supervisors took on August 4th, we want to give Corey, Luce, and Josie a little opportunity to speak about the advocacy work that kind of went on in the background and then also then after them, Kim's work, to make sure, uh, you know, this was not an easy path to see this happen for Riverside County. But when it did happen, it was a unanimous vote by the Board of Supervisors. But that doesn't happen just out of the blue. So I would love to hear from Luce first, then Corey, then Josie, on some of the steps that you all took to help to bring this, this issue to the forefront. Yes, uh, well, first of all, uh, this issue has been long overdue, uh, especially in our county, in a very diverse county where we have we have part of our county be a border region. As far as the work that we do as an immigrant justice organization, uh, there are so many ways that we see public health um, as far as the lens that we see as an organization, not only dealing with the health and well-being of our community of our of our members as far as their their mental health and so their um, health um, within themselves, but also now money, you know, economy, housing, food safety, fear, and employment. Uh, COVID has really shed light uh, to a lot of um, inequalities uh, and challenges and fears that our community that we work with within the immigrant community that have been out there for years. So this was uh, a great, uh, this was long overdue and um, we have been gathering uh, the stories of our community of the grassroots and elevating them uh, not only here at the county but at the state level to continue creating social change and systems change. And as far as um, the county in the back, uh, what we did in the back scenes and as far as our organizing and advocacy and also mobilizing, especially during COVID, we um, COVID has really cha um, challenged us to be innovative as far as our strategies. Um, and now we have to social distance and us being an organization that's always been on the ground. It, I mean, it was a challenge, but thank, um, thanks to God, we weathered through the storm and thanks to um, wonderful partners here as well. So uh, we started talking, we've been talking about this within our membership for years and we are taking what COVID has done is really giving us that extra push that we are we are tired 
we are overwhelmed and we cannot stay quiet. We cannot stay quiet and we need to continue pushing through because this is very, very personal. As um, due to COVID, I mean, we have lost so many lives, so many lives. And I know we're gonna continue losing lives of our families, of our members, but um, racial um, racism, racial justice is not just, you know, as far as health, we see it as a very comprehensive approach as to the work that we do. And what we did with this in, in a partnership in a united front with all these organizations, with Reach Out, with Corey, with a lot of partners, uh, we basically mobilized our community and elevated the voices, talking to our supervisors, um, gathering petitions, uh, but also seeing our county of Riverside, we are truly blessed to be honest, of, to live in the county of Riverside, where the county of Riverside continues to, even though there, there's some differences and with some things that come up to the border and whatnot, but we continue the city of Riverside, the county of Riverside stepping up for its most vulnerable communities. But that took a lot of organizing of many decades to kind of create that um, atmosphere and, and companionship and true partnership, um, not only with, the, uh, with community and partners, but also with our elected officials. And then having partners like everybody here, but then also having an insight partner like Kimberly and her team that we see uh, the Riverside County is setting the stage for other counties to follow, uh, not only with this uh, with this resolution that we pushed forward, but and then having anonymous support from our county board of supervisors, but also the most recent win that we have here in the county of Riverside, and we are so proud. Our farm worker uh, harvest um, how, uh, farm worker assistance program that is the first one in the state, the first one in the country, and Riverside County continues to have be on the spotlight. It, but that didn't come that didn't come because of luck that came through years of organizing and, and mobilizing and advocating and elevating the realities of the community and having partners uh like reach out like corey's organization and then having insider staff that really care about the community and that's what we see with the county of riverside even its staff is very it, it's 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 very um Entregados, I'm really, a bit, um, if somebody could help me with that translation, to the work that they do with a passion. And, and we are just so dedicated. blessed that, that, I'm sorry? Dedicated. Dedicated, dedicated that it's not only a job, and us as organizers, and I could talk about um, Josie and Diana and Corey that we're like on the ground organizing community. We don't see this as a job. We see this as a lifestyle. I see it as a lifestyle. I've done this since I was born. So uh, having uh, even county staff that is dedicated and committed to elevate the stories and create these systems change that a resolution may just be a paper, but at the end of the day, it means a lot to community. It means a lot to community as we've seen throughout the years where we, Riverside County, I could, a little bit of history. Uh, when we were mobilizing for immigration reform, um, 2006, um, in the, uh, working at the federal level, uh, mobilizing over a million letters to, the, to our um, to DC, the County of Riverside's Board of Supervisors was the only county in the whole United States that voted in favor of a resolution and not just voted in favor to pass the immigration, uh, immigration reform with a pathway to citizenship, but they actually flew out to DC where we delivered the over a million letters and presented it to Congress. So this is, there's a history of Riverside County. The, another one was DACA. DACA, first county in the whole United States that passes a resolution to support DACA. I mean, and not just, you know, and it, it might be a piece of paper just like this one, but it does mean a lot to our community that it really sees, the community sees that Riverside County has its back. But then there's still a lot more to do. And we are truly blessed to have Kim in the inside and other county staff that are truly dedicated. And we're gonna continue elevating our voices of our grassroots because we are living this trauma on the ground every day as we're seeing our community, not just fear, 
for their well-being, but also um, fear for even some of the times, depending on the region and the part of the cities that they live here, even for their neighbors um, because of their color of their skin, that in our country has really turned around. That was now it's okay to be anti this, anti that. And people have really taken upon themselves and showed the feeling that it's okay to hate and to act on their hate. But um, here in the county of Riverside, we are so blessed that we were um, as a collective front, um, not only all of us here and other partners that are not here on the panel, but that we work together to push this through. And for the uh, county of Riverside Board of Supervisors that really listened to all of us and voted anonymously to get this through. So it might be a piece of paper, but it does mean a lot to our grassroots. And thank you, um, partners, Kimberly, Diana, Corey, Josie, and all, a lot of folks here that are not on the panel, but it was a united front effort. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Luz. That was wonderful and impassioned. Thank you, as always. Uh, Corey, go ahead and follow that, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, uh, I'm not used <laughs> to being in this position. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, I, I would say this: that that is is that uh, whenever I mean we hear this all the time. Whenever there's a crisis, there's an opportunity, and um, it's being able to recognize uh, when those opportunities are coming. Um, and be able to have a plan on how to execute that. I think my uh, my primary responsibility uh, in this effort is, was really to help mobilize um, other um, African American organizations, um, other African American elected officials, um, and the movement began to. Um, attract uh, many other groups uh, to the call for justice and being able to channel that energy uh, to be able to have a consistent message. Uh, most people don't understand that, you know, when we first asked for this resolution, um, between the time that we first asked and the time that it was done was over a month, right? And so these were these were times where, you know, first uh, we had, um, we know we had COVID and the ins and outs about that, George Floyd, um, and we had a lot of gut reaction to things. So it took a while to first introduce it and then begin to in engage in individual dialogue, um, but then making sure that we made it clear that we're not just going to go away either. Um, and I think the challenge for all of us is, um, how do you um, engage in disruptive discussions, um, uncomfortable discussions, um, but you're doing it in a sense of moral responsibility and love, right? And so I, I think what allowed us to get here um, is number one, I remember um, many of uh, African-American organizations began to uh, go to um, the Board of Supervisors before COVID-19 really hit. Uh, no, actually before George Floyd hit, because it was COVID-19 then George Floyd. Um, and so during COVID-19, we began to see all over the nation the huge disparities um, in terms of African-American infections and mortality rates. And then that began to draw the picture of why racism is a public health crisis, right? So we began to go to the Board of Supervisors as in the African-American community to say, we're seeing the data and this is racism in action when you look at this data. And then when we are able to do that, we began to first make our first plea, right? And of course, there was a whole lot of other discussions going on <laughs> during these meetings, right? Uh, a, a lot of intense conversations, a lot of intense actions, 
a lot of intense name calling, you know, all of those type of things. Uh, but in the tradition of our nonviolent tradition, right, is that um, our job was to identify the facts, um, provide a solution, not just complain about something, um, and say, this is what we need. It is the morally right thing to do. Of course, once we did that, we waited two weeks, we didn't hear anything. Uh, so um, we then uh, uh, organized um, African-American elected officials. And, and many people don't realize that in terms of elected officials, the African-American community um, is, uh, we have members of all political parties. Uh, but we said together, we went back to the Board of Supervisors um, and said, this is a critical issue. We must take action. You know, we would love to work with you to be able to get this done. A few more weeks went by, right? By this time, government started shutting down. Um, and, but we still use public comment to be able to do things. We began to engage in individual conversations with members of the Board of Supervisors and their staff to be able to provide some type of opportunities. Um, and then after a while, uh, I'm not sure at what point that it, it began to click with many others, um, was that they, their, uh, members of the board began to see it as a moral obligation for themselves. Um, and once that happened, the whole dynamic changed, right? And then they began to tell their stories they began to reflect because this because what we just thought as disruptions in time we began to realize that no this is actually a special moment in history and what is history going to say about us about what we did during this time right and so when you understand that you're in a historical time where kids will be reading about this in history books your perspective begins to change where where is my role in history what is history going to say about me right and so once that that was done uh, I, I remember one particular um uh zoom meeting with a supervisor and there was many of us in african-american community different political spectrums different age groups right um, and, uh, it, you know, of course, there were some tense times, <laughs> right? Uh, but the idea was we, you know, uh, the, the supervisor said that, you know what, we, we, we need to do this. And then, you know, um, I thank God for, for uh, Kimberly, who, who really um, understood it from her professional perspective, um, because really, it's her profession that kick this baby off to give us the facts, right? How do you change just a opinion, right? Or a sentiment to what the facts are, right? And there, there's no greater professional accomplishment to be able to step in your professional role and be able to advance something, right? That your profession was called to do. Wow, how special that is right and so um what people need to understand the the discussions are still happening uh the role the 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 uh, the resolution is just the vehicle in which we're supposed to get to the final destination the resolution is not the final destination right and so what people need to understand that when we look at movements we looked at the civil rights movement the civil rights movement was over a decade long. It wasn't a few months. It wasn't a summer, right? It was like 15 years long. The Montgomery bo bus boycott was over a year long, right? So what we need to understand is that we have to understand how long these things happen. Uh, why it's important to have longevity and stay consistent. But the idea is, is that how do you continue to put pressure, but that pressure and love, right? It's like when my mom used to uh, 
give me a uh, give me a slap on my arm when I was doing something wrong. And and she said that was just a love tap, right? <laughs> right. So how do you give each other some love taps to say, hey, I need to get your attention, right? We, we need to do some stuff, right? But I'm doing it in love and and a sense of I'm not taking this personal. I I, I don't th I'm not demonizing you as a human being, but this issue is so important that I cannot stop. And I'm asking you to join with me, right, for us to make this great achievement together. Um, and so I, I really believe that when this is all said and done, um, many of us will reflect on these stories about tough conversations that we had to have with one another, um, moments of those aha moments, right? Because when we first said that, if, we, if the Board of Supervisors would have voted, when we first requested this, uh, we're not sure if we would have gotten the third vote, right? It's through this journey that society was having and those contexts and conversations, right? One of which I remember having right here on one of these webinars, right? Of course. And, and sharing our life experiences. Because when you share your own life experiences, what happens? You be able to you 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 begin to help create empathy in other people to learn from your perspective. And so, after many many other people and many on the board of supervisors sharing their stories with their colleagues, uh, that they were able to begin to win other members of the supervisors over. Because even on the day of. I, I was, I, I had no clue it was going to be unanimous. <laughs> I was still trying to figure out exactly, is that third vote really coming? <laughs> <laughs> Not only did you get three, you got five. So and we were all taking, we got off the call and said, what happened? <laughs> and Corey, you know? I think that's a good place to have uh, Josie jump in um, and then we'll go to Kim in a minute, but um, you know, so much great advocacy from Luce's groups and many others, from Corey's groups and many others, and then Latino health collaboratives work in actually an outgrowth of these webinars. Uh, Josie, if you want to talk about that and and what what Latino health collaborative did to to help in the background. Well. We started with our webinars um, and I wanted to have a little more understanding and awareness to the community to on the topic that was going on. And um, I learned a lot more than I thought I was gonna learn. Um, just being aware, the awareness that came out, the concerns, um, the, this webinar has, these webinars have been um, awesome just for us to understand I know I had a lot of different opinions, a lot of different um, things that were that were going on that I never expected because I brought this up to um, our webinar just to have awareness and understanding. I had a lot of people that um, I was very surprised with them, their reaction on what this topic was about. Um, I kept trying to understand and, and telling myself it's like all life matters. It's like it's all life. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to see it as just whatever other people are saying. Just say all life matters. But it was very hard for me to um, understand a lot of the people, how they think, how they reacted to this. Um, we brought it up and, and it's been like a learning journey, um, a learning journey because it's been hard for me to understand how other people react and um, mostly um, attack me, I guess I can say, because I was very hurt. I was very, um, deep. I got very depressed just to see all these people that were, just because I brought this up to learn more about it. Um, it was very hard, it was very hard. Um, but we opened it up. We had a lot of people, uh, with good comments and good thoughts. Um, that's where the resolution came up. Um, they asked us if we could do something about it. Um, if reach out, LHC can um, help them. Just bring something out to the table to make it known that we are talking about it and we want to learn more. And we wanted public health to help us with this crisis and see what else we can do to help them. 
So um, it's been a very, very um, hard and heartbreaking to me personally, uh, but I've learned a lot and we, we're still learning more. Um, I just hope that a lot of the people learn more that it's not just something that we brought up or that people bring up. It's something for everybody, for all lives to be better and to learn more about it, to have their own feelings, it's okay, but to feel good about helping other people, is, it's, it's, it is good, it's a good thing for everybody. It's not just for certain people. So our communities have been um, very, very engaged, calling me, emailing me and telling me things, wanting to learn more, wanting to uh, know more about what's happening and what's gonna um, continue to happen. So this is why we got together today in this webinar to just to let everybody know um, what our next steps are. But personally, I have been learning a lot more than I thought I was going to learn with this. So I just want to say um, thank you to everybody that's helping. And um, thank you to uh, all the people that have been coming and telling me different things, uh, calling me, emailing me. Um, with those comments and those things that they ask, um, I've been learning a lot more. We've been working with this um, topic for a while. Diana and I are um, been thinking about it before all this happened. It just seems like it just happened at the right time. It's not a good thing to say, but it just happened because um, we had already been thinking about it. And we'll tell you a little bit more of why we had already thought about it before it started to go um, bigger. And um, But I just want to say thank you to everybody because I've learned a lot. I'm still learning more, but because of all this that's happening, um, we've been educating ourselves and our communities have been asking more questions and emailing me to put different things in the webinar so they can learn a little bit more of all these issues that are happening. So um, that's one of the big things that I've learned and I wanna say thank you to everybody. Uh, the good and the bad came and um, I've, I've learned a lot. I just want to say thank you to everybody that's being there for um, for our next steps that we're going to take. And thank you. That's all I can say. Thank you. <laughs> well, Josie, you were able to mobilize from a lot of the people probably who are on this call today a letter to all the Board of Supervisors, actually for both counties, mm -hmm. to our public health departments, our law enforcement partners as well, you know, with some, you know, things that Latino Health Collaborative and the people on this forum wanted to see, taking the feedback of the people here, putting it into a letter form and sending that out. And I think that was um, such a beautiful moment, but that also, like Josie said, in which all of you are expressing, you know, you get the good with the bad on this and you get people that do not agree with you and will, very happily make their thoughts known to you. And some people, relationships, honestly, at Reach Out that we've had for years have actually quit talking to us because of the work that we're doing. And we hope that those bridges will be repaired yet over time because I think people are struggling right now. And I'm sure all of you have had similar things happen, but it's, you know, it's difficult when those things happen. All right. So the three of you, what amazing work, um, you know, just all three of you just to reflect on those things. And now I want to turn to Kim, who, you know, we're kind of all, you know, as nonprofit organizations, I don't want to say we're on the outside, but we kind of sometimes feel like we're on the outside looking in at point, certain points. Um, but, you know, so we're out here doing all these things. And then, you know, within, there's a different uh, view. Right, that that Kim, as the director of public health, was also working as an ally. And so, Kim, want to give you a good chunk of time, um, you know, and kind of on our plans for today to feel free to talk about what you were doing before, but then also go ahead and jump into now that the resolution has passed and the things that are here on the screen right now. If you want to go ahead and just jump straight to that too, after you talk about the pre-work. Great, thank you so much, Diana. Thank you. thank you to Corey and Josie and Luz because really we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the efforts of 
these three individuals, their organizations, Diana, you, all the other community-based organizations that really, really have been elevating the equity issue, elevating the racism issue uh, to a point where we can push those uncomfortable conversations. I heard all of you say that, and they are uncomfortable conversations, but they're conversations that have to be had. Um, so I, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about kind of our journey on how we got to the resolution, uh, which intertwines uh, so intimately with what our three previous speakers have said. Um, so in, in public health, we kind of see ourselves as, um, neutral conveners, right? So we want to put together programs. We want to um, make sure that people have, um, you know, that diseases are controlled, that we're doing injury prevention programs, that we're working on living, livable communities, all of these things. Um, but there really has been a change in public health, I think over the last probably five years um, and, and sometimes a little bit farther back where we're getting more into the, the realm of social justice and, and I think that there's so much more understanding of how all of these things impact a person's health outcome, right? And how they're going to be successful um, and live healthy lives. And so in public health, of course, we, we really um, live and breathe this and understand this and, and equity is one of our core principles as we are rolling out our programs and, and thinking about new programs. Um, and I, I'm gonna confess some of my, um, my faults to you, things that the staff think I'm absolutely crazy about. Uh, but one of the things that I love is I love to read and I love to learn. And I think, um, it, Josie, you're the one who said that this is like an educational journey. Um, and so one of the things that we've done is with all of our management and public health, we now have kind of a book club. And so the first book that we read was around health justice. And that really looks at across the whole scope from legal justice, uh, policing, housing, all of those things, how all of those things impact health outcomes. Um, and I loved the book um, and the staff really got into it. It's kind of a, a legalese type book, but it just it was so relevant to the work that we do every day. Um, and then, of course, we read uh, Nadine Burke Harris's book around adverse childhood experiences and how that trauma that you live every day throughout your life impacts you in so many other aspects of life. And so we really have to intervene at those early levels to make a difference. Um, so we have been doing things like doing trainings. All of our staff have had to go through equity training, six part equity trainings from the very, actually it's been probably 15 years that we've been doing that, looking at implicit bias and some of those things. Um, and I have to tell you, I am an epidemiologist by training, so I'm a total data nerd. And so I always carry around charts with me every time I go somewhere that talks about the inequities that we face in our county, from our poverty level, from renting versus owning a house, from uh, asthma visits in our emergency room, hypertension, all of those things. Uh, and so I think that we, COVID was an opportunity uh, for us as well to really elevate this. And what I mean is it really, COVID thrust public health into the limelight, whether we wanted it or not, in terms of um, being at the tip of the spear for leading the response. And so we had an opportunity where we were with the executive office and the board almost daily at the beginning and having these conversations about response, but also having conversations about who is being impacted by COVID. And as um, Corey and Luz both mentioned, you know, we do see disproportionate impacts of COVID in our communities, both in cases where our Latinx population has a case rate of um, 234 per 10,000, uh, our African-American case rate is 94 um, per 10,000, and our white case rate is 65, right? So what are those things that make those communities um, more susceptible or more likely to be infected with COVID? We also see higher death rates in our Latinx population. They represent 47% of the population, but 51% of our COVID deaths. So using those facts um, with the Board of Supervisors and the Executive Office, and then broadening those to talk about overall community impacts and elevate the work that all of the organizations on this call and other organizations have been doing um, around the county. Um, and then the issue around the farm workers uh, that Luz brought up, the home to harvest um, and the support that there was for the board. It just was a ripe opportunity to really push this through. Um, and 
I have to say, Corey, when we had that call with uh, with one of our supervisors and all of our African American colleagues, um, I think that that was really a turning point because it really helped for the board to understand and hear from all of you. Um, and it just was it was incredible. I left that meeting feeling like, okay, this is something we are going to get done. Um, and so I was really inspired. And and again, just thank you for for uh, pushing us to have those uncomfortable conversations. Um, and then I think, you know, we've we've brought this issue up of racism as a public health crisis with all of the different county departments. I share that health justice book. People don't want to come to my office anymore because I always give it out when I um, when people come to my office. Uh, so I've given it to our chief probation officer, to our executive officer over public safety, all of these folks who then come back to me and say, wow, I get what you're talking about. And so it's really important that we equip people with the tools to be able to have the uncomfortable conversation, right? And so we're coming at it at a place of facts and truth and people's lived experiences versus just what people feel, right? Because that's not that's not always the right place to come from. Um, so I think, you know, another kind of turning point for me was I remember having a conversation uh, with one of my colleagues and they said, Kim, why are you pushing this? Why, why is this so important to you? Maybe you should just, you know, let it go. And I said, you know, this is a moral issue for me. This is something we have to address. We are not going to be successful as a county, as a community, as a health department if we don't tackle this. And so, um, so it, by no means was I the driver um, or, I'm, I again see myself as a facilitator. It really was driven by the grassroots community organizations saying this is something that we need to do. Um, and and I love what all of you said. I wrote down quotes that I'm going to use um, over time. But you know what is history going to say about us? And so I, I sit here today and think, okay, history cannot say that this was just a piece of paper. History must say that this was just the start of a revolution and that we are going to work hard to change what we are seeing in Riverside County. Um, we have to have these difficult conversations and give each other those love taps, Corey, like you mentioned, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because we also all have priorities and things that we need to get done because we have funding sources and we're tied to work plans and all of those things. But we have to think of everything we do through this lens of equity and how we're gonna make a difference. And that has to be in our mind and at the forefront of our minds uh, every day as we move forward. So um, when I hear all of you talk, I just get chills and I get really excited because I just feel like there's so much momentum right now and there's so much that we're gonna do as a community. So um, so I just, again, wanna thank all of you because you are, you are all my heroes and um, you keep me going and keep me involved in this fight because I see the great work that you're all doing. Um, so that's kind of just a little backstory on, on how we got here. Uh, so August 4th is when the board voted unanimously uh, to declare racism as a public health crisis. Uh, I think that you know we, we have our chair is absolutely a, a champion of this, uh, Supervisor Perez. Um, and so we have had lots of conversations about what this is going to look like uh, going forward. So in our board submittal, we call them Form 11s, we had listed several actions, which Diana has on the screen here. Um, and again, these are just kind of the start of some of the things that the county is going to be doing. And really what we're gonna start with is some listening sessions. So the county is gonna hold three listening sessions um, uh, in the evening and on the weekend. Um, and, you know, of course, COVID makes us a little bit more challenging because I'm a face to face kind of person. I would love to be in a room and have these conversations. And that's a little more, more difficult with COVID. But nonetheless, we're going to have them anyway. Um, and these three listening sessions are just the start because all of us know three listening sessions are not going to be anywhere near enough, right, to get to the root of what is going on and get to the root of what the community expects and the community deserves. And so those are the conversations that we wanna have. Um, and so, you know, I I think that out of those community sessions, we'll, we will clearly hear that there needs to be more listening sessions throughout the county um, with, different, with different groups um, and really make sure that we're being inclusive. So um, I believe that the listening sessions are scheduled for the first one is September 29th and then October 6th, 
and I believe October 21st, but um, it's on, it'll be on our website on public health, it's on the county's website, and we'll be doing uh, more outreach so that the community is aware of when those will be. In terms of kind of some of the other things that the county is going to be working on, we really want to look internally as a county structure and look at all of our programs and our rules around programs and see there are definitely rules that make it harder for communities of color to access services that are needed, right? There are definitely rules that can be um, changed to be more inclusive. And so we really wanna look at what are those things uh, and, and make changes. And there's a commitment as you saw from a 5-0 vote on the board, our executive office, everybody's totally on board to do this. Um, it's really a, an incredible time in government um, to, to do this. And I think there's also really an understanding that this isn't this isn't just government. It's everybody working together, right? It's it's community organizations, it's the people, it's government, it's all of us coming to the table to make the changes that are necessary to get at the systemic roots of racism, because that's what we're talking about are those decades, centuries of, of systemic racism, right? That are um, at the root of so many of the problems that we're seeing today, and certainly in, from a health perspective. Um, we talked a little bit about education. That's going to be another kind of uh, really critical point for the county is focusing on educating our county employees, making sure they understand what racism is, what it means when we talk about systemic racism, what implicit bias is so that they can recognize that they may be framing something in a way that is based on their own experience and they need to be able to step back and look at that and, and understand the influence of their own experience or what they've heard, um, how that might be influencing them and, and then again go back to the facts and the, and the lived experience um, that is so important in shaping our direction. Um, I think education for the public as well and that's something where our, our community-based organizations are much better suited to do that because you are our um, trusted partners in the community you are um, already embedded in the community and and we like to think of ourselves as a as very community focused but we can't hold a candle to you all when it comes to that and that's just the truth i mean that's why the partnership is so critical um, and so important for us to work together um, and then I think that you will see a, a re, an emphasis as we move forward in the county at looking at our, our hiring practices, making sure that our community is represented in our government structure. And so I can tell you, uh, this is a small example, as we were hiring 350 people, contact tracers for COVID, one of the things we looked at is, does the group that we hired represent the community, right? Do we have um, promotoras on there so that we can reach out to the Latinx community? Do we have people that represent our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander group, our African American group? What do we have all those people? And and I'm happy to say that yes, we do. Um, and we've been very deliberate about who we bring on. And I think you're going to see more of that in all levels of the county government. Um, and so I'm really excited about that because I think. I think bringing people who have that community experience, have that lived experience is gonna be really important as we move forward in this work. Um, so those are kind of where we're thinking uh, from the county perspective, and that's just scratching the surface. Uh, you know, we really wanna elevate all the work that's already been done in the community. We wanna build on that. Um, we wanna support that uh, however we can. And um, again, I just think it's an opportunity, I think, we need to have the uncomfortable conversations, give each other those love taps, and let's make history. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, thank you so much. That was such a great overview. And I just want to say, Kim, how important it is to all of us on the ground out here to have your leadership. And from the moment you stepped into that position, I can remember the first time I kept, came in and met with you, I was just blown away by your welcoming spirit because we don't always get that when we come to meet with government. And from the very first time I met you, I walked out of there like floating on air because I just was so, so excited to meet someone who clearly loved working with community organizations, knew their value. And, um, you know, and that was probably a couple of years ago now. and since that time, you've not only shown that just in a meeting, but that your real commitment is there. And so I just wanna say 
thank you because we don't always find that you know from the nonprofit side and uh, just to see that in leadership of the county has has it's just wonderful thank so, you Diana and I just have to I just have to give you a plug for my uh, I had the same feeling when I got to meet with you and hear about all the great things that your organization is doing but I also just have to give a plug for my team because I have an amazing team at the health department that is so passionate about this um, and so you know I, I couldn't do it if it wasn't for them because they truly are amazing. So just wanted to mention yeah. that. Now, we work with so many of your team. I'm sure all of us do that are on this panel today. And we do. We find that same spirit. And it's just and that's what I think is so refreshing about our region in general. And we've said this for a long time. Uh, since you know i've been working in this region for more years than i'd like to admit that i've been alive um uh, but so it's we don't have a lot right a lot of money and so we've always had to rely on each other whereas i think sometimes the more prosperous counties they always comment on like wow you guys really work together well you really collaborate well and you don't see that in some of our neighboring more prosperous counties where people are like always fighting amongst each other or kind of competing you know against everything and we have spent decades collaborating and you know and i think these this work that's come out is because we have for decades worked together on many other issues and then at these really critical times we can pull it together in ways i think that other counties aren't able to our region were the first ones to pass these resolutions around racism being a public health crisis. We were trailblazers in that. And that didn't, you know, that didn't happen just because, you know, one day somebody woke up and said, wow, what a great thing to happen. You've all heard now what, what happened behind the scenes and quite frankly, not just the weeks of work, but the years of work and relationship building that went into making this possible. And that's something I hope that, you know, when we do become outrageously prosperous here in the Inland Empire, that we never lose that collaborative spirit and that we always, always have these strong relationships. Um, so I want to turn right now of really talking about uh you know as we look at these listening sessions so this is going to be the first step in and i just want to assure everyone that's on the call that we'll make sure to get those dates out to everyone uh, you know and make sure that you have that information kim we also had uh, a request from uh one of our listeners here from cecilia Hurtado, that would like to know your book club book list and she would like you to share that with us and we can also if you don't mind sharing that with us we'll send that out also to the group afterwards via email i think that's a great question thank you thank sure. you cecilia for asking that um so as we the first thing that's going to happen you see these other big the first three bullet points there the one two and three you know diversity in the county's workforce and leadership uh solutions to systemic inequality for external services, uh, enhance public education to increase understanding. These three bullet points are long-term, deep work that is going to have to happen. Um, but the listening sessions are going to be happening right away. And so do all of you have any recommendations of, you know, how, what you would like to see happen at those listening sessions, you know, special points that you want to bring up. How will those, uh, and I see we're running very close to being out of time. So something short, like what would you like to see happen at those listening sessions? And anyone, Corey, do you wanna go first this time? Sure. Um, I believe the perspective we need to come with is share your, your life experiences. That's the most important you can do people need to understand that they there there's power in your story right uh, and which talks about the dignity and humanity of all people is that your story matters right and so you need to tell your story and and, and fit it in the realm of this is how I'm this is the life that me and my family is experiencing right and we're asking you to help 
rectify these things with because with every story there's a data set that can be a related to that right and so if you just tell your story and then there's some of us who are more apt to research things and come up with suggestions there'll be many of us doing that too but don't think you have to do that all of us has a special role to play and if all you do is show up and tell your story you are contributing to the wave of change that we're, we're, we're starting to see here. Wonderful suggestion, Corey, and something that every one of us carries with us. So you don't have to do any special preparation. You just need to show up and be genuine, right? And, and express your story and your concerns. Uh, Luce or Josie, any comment on that one, Luce? Yes, I agree with uh, Corey. Uh, it, when talking to community, it's important to have a conversation versus a guiding question type of setting. So you could get real raw and real, real conversations going. I know when people think of government, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, kind of get, you know, antsy or whatnot. But also use us as a resource, you know, use us as a resource since we're organizations that are on the ground that have these spaces already. I think we're your one of your best allies to really capture what's really going on in the grassroots. That's such a great point, Luce. And I think you know, when I heard that there were going to be three listening sessions. I thought, well, three in each district? I was like, no, three for the whole county. I was like, oh, I don't know if that's enough, uh, you know which I don't think it is. So, but I'll just, I'll say that that is my, my uh, prejudice right there, not enough. Uh, so Josie, do you have uh, anything you'd like to add to that? I just wanted to um, say, um, personally, I think if we all open our minds and look at it as something wide for everybody, um, it'll be easier than just to think of something, just one, one, person or one thing. But I think um, educating ourselves more and with everything that um, we're all doing together, I think it's going to help all of us or a lot of us um, just jump to the next step and, and see how things can see. You can see things differently in the other side. Um, it's not all just what in the surface of uh, what's going on and the topic that's going on. If you open your mind and you're going to see the other side and see everything, um, it's gonna be different and it's gonna be better for each one of us. Um, so I just wanna say, um, open your minds and just look at everything that's gonna help everybody, not just certain people. It's just gonna be something fantastic that's gonna happen, that it's gonna help the whole county. Thank you. That is so true, so true, Josie. Um, yeah. It, I think it doesn't matter who you are, the more that you listen, the more the the better human you become. And um, I just think that's so important. Kim, how about you? What would you like to see come out of the listening sessions or what do you think it's important to bring there? I, I think that uh, that our other panelists covered it. I think the one thing that I would love to hear is what's your vision for what this will look like for Riverside County? What does it look like if we have a system, a community um, that is free from systemic racism and, and there are no more inequities? What, what does that look like? And, and we need to have that, those lofty goals um, that we're working towards because they're, I think that they're inspirational. Um, and so I think that that's, that's part of it. Yeah, I, sometimes we, no one ever really asks us what our ideals would be, right? We don't, we're just so used to day to day, just hacking it through, right? And when we get a chance to kind of lift our heads up and look around and say, this is our vision for our region, you know, what a special moment that is. And with the right people at the table that all of us together can make that happen. That's a really, really choice moment. Uh, Luce apologizes. Apparently they have a blackout at her office or wherever she's calling from. And so she got totally thrown out. And um, so, oh, it's heartbreaking. And so anyway, so if she can jump back in, she will, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, so 
I think one of the most important things around this, and this is something that I know at Reach Out, we talk about all the time. Uh, I have a lot of very young staff that can be really impatient a lot of times, which I kind of like, you know, because they keep me on my toes. And so, um, but, you know, it's like, we need to get racial justice done, Diana. We need to make sure this is done. And I'm like, guys, it's never done. You know, it doesn't matter what we do and how well we do it will never be done. And it really is. I've heard every one of you talk about this being a journey and it will be a lifelong journey. And um, I think that that's so important that it's more important, I think, to get it right than to rush and, you know, see little tiny wins when we could have had big wins over time. Uh, not a lot of time you know, but let's, let's do this the right way. Um, and I, I'm noticing in the question box too, that uh, folks asking about the recording and we will be posting the recording. We'll send that out to everyone as well, just so that you have that if you had to jump off. So um, before I switch over, I know we're over time. I, I feel a little justified because I did warn everybody at the beginning, we were going to go over, but um, I wanted to just, before we uh, talk about our last thing that we kind of teased at the beginning is, are there any final comments from uh, Corey, Kim, or Josie that you would like to make before we turn to our next thing? Uh, the, the, only, the last thing I would say uh, is that uh, we know there's a lot of rhetoric, rhetoric out there that makes it feel like that maybe this struggle is for one particular group or another, um, but this is a human struggle. Um, and what is making this such a historical moment in our lives right now is that fellow human beings are speaking up and fighting for each other, regardless of society's barriers that they've tried to put upon us. And so I would really be, I, I, I implore people to participate uh, in these listening sessions, to participate in anything and everything that you can, right? Don't think because you're not black or you're not this or you're not that that you you that that you should sit on the sideline, right? That no hu hu history and humanity is calling all of us to speak and, and speak tr uh, uh, truth to power, and so. I would just urge people, please, uh, we've worked so hard for even these listening sessions just to happen. It would be a shame if we do not all participate in this, right? Because this is all of us taking our power back and guiding our society in the direction that we want it to go, right? And so please, I, I would just urge everyone um, to participate, um, do whatever you can. It's not about what you do, it's do something, right? Um, and, and if you do that, uh, then um, we will all have something to be proud of uh, when we start, re when society starts reflecting on this time. So well put, Corey, thank you for that. Josie, any last words or, and then um, we'll go to Kim. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say um, thank you to everybody that uh, has, just stepped up and um, emailed me and called me to just educate me a little bit more. I want to apologize to people that I think got offended because I'm talking about this issue. Um, personally, I think all life matters and I, I'm going to do what I believe. And I just want to appreciate everybody that's helped me um, learn more and step up and continue going forward on what I believe that life, all life matters. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody that's helping. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Kim? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I can add anything um, that is that is more significant. Um, and I think, you know, what Corey said really gets to the heart of this. This is our opportunity. We have to seize it. Um, we need to all come to the table and work together. Doesn't matter what your background is, what organization you represent, um, any of that. We need to come to the table as a community and 
figure out how we are going to address this, how we're going to make a difference so that the lives of our residents are, are greatly improved and we can all live happy, healthy, safe lives. Um, uh, such wise words from all of you. And I just feel so humbled to have been able to be part of this. Uh, thank you to Josie for letting me facilitate today. Uh, and I'm really excited to have Josie be able to participate as one of the panel today. And she's been carrying these webinars by herself pretty much, you know, with some team support obviously in the background, but she's just done such an amazing job on that. Jesus, uh, could I have you go on to the next slide? Um, and, oh, yeah, or I think you may have to switch. There we go, thank you. So, this is extremely difficult hard work don't let anyone tell you differently and there's no one right way to do it and i think you know as long as you're working on things you know that's that's a good thing uh so whatever you're doing just keep doing it but also uh one of the things because reach out is no different uh than any other organization out there you know, we have our own struggles around these issues, you know, differing opinions on staff, uh, you know, and, and different things about really trying to uh, make that way. And so, you know, we don't come with this announcement with any kind of uh, like, like we have all the answers and we wanna tell you how to do it, no. So what we want to announce right now, uh, many of you know we have a, an initiative called our Center for Civic Policy and Leadership. It's a fellowship program that generally runs between two to three years. Um, and normally it's around uh, health policy and helping all sectors see their role in health policy and that everyone has a role to play in health, whether you're from law enforcement, you're a school teacher, you're uh, in government, you're from a nonprofit, everyone has a role to play. That of course is still true, uh, but we really looked, Josie and I, to see, because this is also one of Josie's other hats that she wears as being in charge of the Center for Civic Policy and Leadership for Reach Out. Um, during this very special time that we are in, how can Reach Out be supportive of all the organizations that are trying to make their way through this, including businesses, governments, law enforcement, everyone. Um, so we're announcing today a fellowship program for teams of people. Normally it's an individual fellowship. This is a team of two to three people from organizations that want to be part of this special CCPL cohort of healing communities through racial justice. Uh, Jesus, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so this is actually going to be a request for applications. We will give you the link here in a minute. Um, and there is a deadline to submit applications of October 22nd at four o'clock. Next slide. And this is a little bit about what it's going to be about. Um, you know, overall, what we will be attempting to do, there will be this full curriculum. We'll meet once a month for 15 months for about three hours, but there will also be uh, executive coaching that will come to your team to help you work through things. When Reach Out does CCPL, we always like to work at three levels. We help work on you as an individual and how you carry around you know the issues around health or normally and now through racial justice issues how does how does that affect you how are you carrying that then we also will be looking at your organization and helping your organization to um, implement policies and systems that take you to being more uh, racial justice and racial equity focused. Uh, then the third layer is then how do you show up in support of others outside of yourself and your organization, but in the larger sphere to really be able to push that for our region. And you can see there at the bottom, um, some of the, very, you know, I know this is a lot of words, um, you know, it'll, 
it's all around building racial responsiveness and inclusivity within the participating agencies internal policies and structures and also with yourself next slide so the selected agencies will receive a grant award in the amount of ten thousand dollars for the 15 month period um, and this is really because this will be a substantial investment of time and effort and this is to help kind of cover some of those costs that you may incur by being involved in here um, and so i think i bolded this part of regardless of where you are your team or your organization is starting this is the right place it will be a safe place to learn to take risks to experiment make mistakes build relationships and create change together i think that's very important this is not going to be a place like i said that even as we roll out content and as we've been identifying the core competencies for folks to come away with this is really just an opportunity for people to have this safe place to learn and be able to build themselves and their organizations to a point where you can very confidently in, engage in the racial justice movement for our region because the people who've been carrying it for so long uh they're getting tired quite frankly you know this is this is not something that they should have to carry themselves leaders like corey like pastor casey dina walker and many others have been carrying a lot of this work and Luis gallegos obviously as well and many others but we have not always all been there to show up for them and this is really also about helping us all be ready to show up for them. Um, and so the actual cohort will start in January, but we're, we're doing the applications. There'll be some other interviews and different things that we'll do before the holidays. And then it'll start the third week of January. Uh, next slide. Here's all the dates. Uh, don't worry about the found here. That is a link, but don't worry about that uh so you'll be notified in november there will be a meet and greet for the the selected folks we are out looking for more money so that we can have more fellows more organizations um, but agencies or businesses or anyone who wants to apply if they meet all of the criteria but we run out of money they'll still be um, asked if they want to join the cohort we may just not be able to have money to support them as the fellowship uh, or if your organization already has enough money to support you and you don't need it you could maybe designate that to someone else um, so we'll start on january 21st and your team needs to be able to commit one of the most important things about this is to be eligible you have to not have taken on racial justice work you know as as like a a thing uh or or been involved in racial justice work in a big way in the past it's not we're not looking for people that are already on the path and are really like corey you're not you're not allowed to be part of this <laughs> except We've already asked Corey, obviously, to be faculty, and he has agreed. Um, and so we have many of our leaders, our local leaders, who have already looked at this and said, and even some of our funders say, we want to be part of this, and uh, we want to be part of the faculty for this. So I really view Reach Out as more of just the convener and you know, helping to put it together, but there will be many voices and uh, teachers that will be part of this uh, and allies that will be built through this. So we're, I, next slide, um, I think is the, this is the application, but we'll also put this, uh, Jesus, I don't know if you can put this up in the, can we put something up in the chat for everyone? I, I think we can. Um, but we'll also email this out. You'll see this starting to go out through social media. It'll be on our website, et cetera, et cetera. So, but we're really excited about being able to do this. And um, again, we're we'll be learning right along with you, and you know, in using our experience that we're having doing the same work to guide and know where some of those bumps are because we've hit those bumps, and you know, we know some of them 
people will probably come up with others as well. Josie, is there anything you would like to add to this? This is your baby. Yes, I wanted to add, um, just if you commit to it, we will give you the dates for our meetings ahead of time and we'll schedule them ahead of time so you guys can know. We do ask if you really commit to it, don't be absent to the meetings. Um, it's very important for you to attend all the meetings. Um, and I think um, this is gonna be a very, very exciting and new thing that everybody's gonna uh, learn from. So I hope that you guys uh, apply and join us. Thank you, Josie. Okay, um, and I think Jesus, was that the last slide? I can't remember. Sorry. Ah, so, anyways, uh, you know, your main point of contact is our lovely Josie Gaetan uh, for everything, you know, including this webinar. And um, I can't tell all of you how much it means to to me, to Josie, uh, Corey. Kim, Luce, who I'm so sorry we lost, uh, si another sign of our times, I'm afraid, to lose power. Um, you know, this conversation has been so rich. I also appreciate the comments in the chat box saying, you know, that like, where can we get the recording? I have team members who need to hear this message. Um, please do share this, share the, the link out on your social media, share it with everyone that you can, because this is, this is happening. This is our chance. As Corey said, this is our time, our chance to make lasting, meaningful change in our region. Don't let it slip away. Stay engaged. Stay active in different coalitions that are working on these issues. Keep, keep you know, poking at the Board of Supervisors in a nice way, right? Corey mentioned, like, having difficult conversations, but being able to walk away as friends and respecting what each other's opinions. And uh, and I think that's another thing we're usually pretty good at here in the IE. We may not agree, but we still show up and we go to meetings together and we're friends and and we and we see through that that because it the at the end of the day, we're all good people and we're just trying to do our best. And we're we're all coming from different backgrounds and, and places. So um, with that, Josie, I'm gonna let you close it out. Uh, I'll turn control back to you, and and we'll and I, thank you so much. I just want to say thank you to everybody, all our, everybody that attended, everybody that was listening. Um, thank you to my panelists, Kim, Kimberly, uh, Corey, Luz. You guys are always um, there for us, and I want to thank you. Uh, there's no words that I can say how much I thank taking the time to come in and meet with us, and. Um, Thank you everybody for attending. We'll be here next Thursday at 12 noon and um, we'll be surprising you on who's coming up next. We uh, have a whole list and if you guys are interested in bringing other information to our webinar, just go ahead and call me or email me and I'll be happy to put you in the schedule. I just uh, want to say thank you everybody. Yeah, Josie, I lied because I have one more thing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> especially because Kim's on, she would kill me if I didn't do this. Uh, <laughs> Masks are medicine, the contests, uh, we're sending out, there's 33 organizations in the county that are putting out these very important uh, contests. And why they're important is because we're asking all of our residents to make uh, 30 second videos or any kind of artwork, writing, songs, poetry, paintings, anything, uh, because we think that Residents speaking to other residents is much more powerful than people sitting in offices trying to figure out what kind of messaging should go out. And so there's every week there are prizes for the winners every week, uh, $50 gift cards for the winners. And then after October 9th, there will be uh, grand prize judging. So there'll be uh, bigger prizes at that time. Please encourage uh, all of your constituencies to make any kind of art around the three simple messages of, that you see here on the screen and submit them at the masksormedicine.org website. And, uh, and we're so excited to see what's already come in. 
And But we need your help to get this word out to more people as well. So please share this message out with people. We'll also send you this through email as well. All right. Now, now I'm done, Josie. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Well, just thank you, everybody, and then we'll see you here next week. I hope that you, everybody just comes and joins us and joins um, Kim and everybody else. Just unite and be ready to work and be ready to listen and be an open mind with your open mind. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next Thursday at 12 noon. Thank you. Thank you. You guys did great. That was amazing, you guys. I am. Thank you. Thank you.